Well, hello and welcome again to Joshua. This is the 22nd sermon on Joshua. And we're going to be into the 23rd chapter of Joshua. Now, just so you'll know, we're, though we're going to be looking at the charge of Joshua or his charge to Israel, um, and that's going to take all of chapter 23, verses 1 through 16, but you're going to see there's also a little bit more of that charge come up in chapter 24. But that's a different meeting. It's a solemn assembly that he calls together. And so we're going to get started in uh, this chapter and in the very first verse. But as we do proceed through this, I at least want to give you again heads up for what my outline is to help you follow along a little bit and break down this whole chapter, we're going to be looking at number one, we're going to be looking at the call to congregate. He's talking about getting them to assemble, come together. And then we're going to see the call to consider. Um, and then we will see the call for courage. And then lastly, the call for correction. Now, I could use the words, the call for confidence, the call for conviction, but it's not that they're doing anything wrong, but it's the idea that you need to be ready for some correction, even in your own life, being aware that we're not perfect. We're still human beings. And this makes good application for us now. So let's start with that very first verse that we look at and see that Joshua called all of Israel came to pass that the Lord had given rest unto Israel from all their enemies round about that Joshua waxed old and stricken in age. And then we see this verse, and Joshua called for all Israel and for their elders and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers and said unto them, I am old and stricken in years. Now, his charge comes by calling for them to come and listen to him. And so we can see the outline that's here, but Joshua, by the way, this is quite a ways and a, a little bit of time as I just really briefly just read verse one, came to pass after a long time after the Lord had given rest unto Israel that Joshua waxed old and stricken in age. And then he called for all Israel to come together. So he's retired. Um, he retired to the city that he built um, later, you'll see how that he is going to call them all to meet at Shechem, where the tabernacle is located. But whether he's exactly at uh, Timnath Sarah, that's in Mount Ephraim, we see that back in 19 and 50, when they gave him his inheritance, they gave him the city which he asked for, even Timnath Sarah in Mount Ephraim, and he built the city and dwelt therein. Now, something stirs him to act. He knows that his days are short and his strength is quickly disappearing. And he felt led of the Lord, I have no question about that, to give them this charge. The first thing that we see is that Joshua called for Israel and the elders to congregate, to assemble so that he could give them this charge. Some call this the council of Joshua. Well, I guess I refrain from using that word because he's not asking them. He's calling them. He's charging them. He is leading them in his final moments of his life as their leader, just as he did when they followed him into battle at the very beginning. And I have to say this, Israel and their leaders did not hesitate. They didn't refuse. You know, a lot of time has passed. They're now at ease. They're living their lives. There's no immediate or even impending threat against them. Yet they came together. And it appears that they did so quickly. They answered the call. Now, in the next chapter, I don't want to get into that yet, but you'll see that Joshua calls for a solemn assembly in Shechem. But we want to look at this whole passage with New Testament eyes. And we ought to recognize that God has called us to assemble in this day and age anymore. People are forgetting what a church is. It is 
an assembly, a called out group of saved, baptized individuals that are given a responsibility to gather together on a consistent basis. And I'm going to tell you, God wants you to congregate. Now that again, that's what the assembly is by definition. Now I know that if you're hearing me, you're not congregating. You may be at home. You may be congregating around your TV or your computer, but I want you to know that's not enough. You need to assemble with the body that God has called you together with. So a church is a particular people who assemble because God has called them to assemble, to congregate. So let's get back into our study. But remember, there's something about assembling. There's something about congregating. God has promised, Christ has promised, where two or three are gathered together in my midst, in other words, where they are gathered by my name, in my authority, that's the assembly. He's there with us. There's something special about the assembly and about assembling together. Then we see the call to consider that we're going to look at back in our text in verse three. We're talking about this, which is the call to consider or to remember or to recollect. We, and he is calling for them to remember this list of how God has blessed them. He isn't just rehearsing his, the history of Israel for the sake of, of recollecting history, but he is reminding this particular generation and he is forming the future generations that Israel is a nation unlike any other. He wanted them to see that God, Jehovah is their God, and he wants them to see what God has done for them. He wants them to see all that Jehovah should mean to Israel. Look at what he says. And ye have seen all that the Lord, that's Jehovah, how that Jehovah, your God, this is a personal relationship. He wants to remind them that Jehovah has done all these things for you. He has all that the Lord had done to you and done unto all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God, he it is that hath fought for you. He is calling for them to consider their personal relationship with God as a nation. In the same way that you and I, when we come to gather together as an assembly, a New Testament body, we are called upon to remember, to recollect, and even list the blessings that God has done for us. The religion that they practice is simply a means of teaching them about the means of reconciliation. It's about teaching them about redemption and then the resulting relationship of that redemption. He is reminding them. He's calling upon them to remember. And what does he do? He talks about the accomplishments of Israel, the victories of Israel over all of the other nations, stronger and mightier than them. You'll see it a little bit later in a verse. Well, actually, you won't because I'm not going to put it up there. But he talks about how that one of you chased a thousand. Remember that? Remember the might, the power, the strength, and everything that was there. The Lord fought for you. And we will see how God is calling upon them. You'll see it in verse five. He's calling upon them to continue to fight and let God fight for them. You see, that history that they have goes back to being freed from Egypt, where they were once enslaved and then promised their own land. It includes those first 40 years. But for this generation in particular, it includes the last several years with all the battles Remember the battle at Jericho, Ai, Bethel, Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, Eglon, Makeda, and all of the others. I'm not going to list them, but I think you get the picture. In all of those, they only had one loss. And once they corrected that failure, they did not have any other losses. Zero, zilch, nada, not one single loss. Brethren, today we're talking about the fact that we should assemble. 
and for the church that we're going to be meeting with on Sunday, listen, we have assembled. We need to recollect the victories that God has given to us. We sing a song, in fact, which encourages us. One of my favorites, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Sometimes we can get down in those molly grubs. We can be depressed, disappointed, disaffection. Some other problem can run over us, it seems. But when we gather together and we begin to rehearse all that God has done for us, it can lift us up. It can encourage us and remind us that God has blessed us. God has quickened you, hasn't he? God sanctified you, hasn't he? God has justified you. God has given you his spirit. God has given you spiritual understanding. And he has given you a guide to lead you on a daily basis. God, I said, has already blessed you with spiritual blessings. The inheritance has been divided. Verse four, he says, behold, I have divided unto you by lot these nations that remain to be an inheritance for your tribes from Jordan with all the nations that I have cut off, even unto the great sea westward. He's reminding them that no one can take it from you. And all of those nations that still remain can't keep you from enjoying God's blessings. For us, think about that one. They're yours. They were theirs perpetually because it was an inheritance to pass from one generation to the next. Well, your blessings, Christian, cannot be stolen. The enemy has been conquered. And notice in verse five what he says that God's promise is still in effect. And the Lord your God, he shall expel them from before you and drive them from out of your sight. And ye shall possess their land as the Lord your God hath promised you. Christian, and in particular, church member, you've been gathered together and called upon to be reminded and to remember all, is God, all that God has done to redeem you and to make you his own. You need to recall all has God, all that God has done for you personally and all that he has promised you. In fact, in the letter to the Corinthian church, which was an absolute mess, but getting corrected in the second letter in chapter seven and verse one, Paul said, having therefore these promises, what promises? Well, you'd have to go back and look at them in chapter six, verses 16 through 18. And he talked about the promises that you are the temple of God. He dwells in us. He meets with us. He walks with us. He makes himself known to us and he makes us to know his love as a father who loves his children. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. These are your promises. They ought to have an effect upon you. There's the call to congregate. There's the call to consider. But then you'll notice in verse six, there's the call for courage, to be courageous. It really is a call for action. Be faithful. And I'm going to tell you to be faithful in this day and age is going to take courage. Look at verse six. Be ye therefore very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, that you turn not aside therefrom to the right hand or to the left. For you and I, Christian, today, this is a call for our obedience, not in order to be saved, but because you are saved, because you are already a child of God. And that call is a for a Christian is for the courage not to deviate. Don't depart from the path of separation. Stay true to Jehovah and do not allow yourself to become polluted through those other nations. That's what he says in verse seven, that you come not among these nations. 
These that remain among you, stay separated from them. Neither make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause to swear by them. Neither serve them, nor bow yourselves unto them. Listen, even in our nation today, there is a rejection of our God and the word of God. We ought to remain separate from the heathen practices, the customs from their gods and remain faithful to Jehovah. Verse eight, what does he say? But cleave unto the Lord your God as you have done unto this day. You've been good so far, he's saying. Now stick with it. Stick by the stuff. Remain faithful to Jehovah. Adhere unto the Lord who has given you victory and super, supernaturally enabled you. Stay joined with Jehovah. Don't cleave to the remnant of those gods. That's the same word there for adhere in verse 12. Don't become ensnared by their heathen practices, their customs, or their gods. This is a mandate. This is a charge. This is a call from Joshua to live the life of faith that you have been given. Walk with your God, follow your God, serve your God, and do not in any way become connected with these heathen customs or their gods. Remember, and that's what verses 9 and 10 says, For the Lord hath driven out from before you uh, great nations and strong, but as for you... No man hath been able to stand before you unto this day. One man of you shall cleanse a thousand for the Lord your God. He it is that fighteth for you as he hath promised you. That one verse gives us insight in how they were battling against all these nations. Can you imagine how that one man chased a thousand? I don't think that's figurative. I think that's literal. This is why Joshua tells them in verse 11 to pay particular attention to themselves. In verse 11, he says, take good heed, therefore, unto yourselves that you love the Lord your God. There ought to be nothing come between us and our God. Be vigilant over yourself, over your love for Jehovah Remember, our God is a jealous God, and you cannot serve God and mammon. You can't become divided in your service. Don't mix your faith with any mechanical sort of religion. Attach yourself and your love to Jehovah. We see it in the New Testament where Paul was writing to the churches of Galatia, and he told them to stand fast, therefore, in the liberty <clears throat> wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What Joshua called them to do, and what this passage for us as New Testament Christians calls for us to do, is takes courage when everyone around you is caving into the culture of this world. You and I need to be courageous and follow the Lord and him only. Idolatry, surprisingly, was the problem then, wasn't it? That's what these other heathen nations were involved in. But did you know that idolatry was a problem in the New Testament as well? In fact, do you know how the Apostle John ended his first letter to the people that he loved? He told them in 1 John 5 and 21, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Don't let anything come between you and your God. Could I ask you if your love has changed? What's happened to your love for God? Is he still the love of your life? Is it still strong? Is he still in first place? Or have you forgotten to take heed to yourselves? Lastly, I want to talk to you about this call for correction. It really is a warning. It's a call for conviction. It's a call for control. 
Joshua has told them that they have the promise of God's protection. But he also warned them that God's faithfulness to his word means that you could have problems. Look with me at Joshua 23 and verse 12. It wasn't that they were going astray. It wasn't that they were having these problems, but he's telling them that God has kept his promise of protection. Well, he's also going to keep his promise of purging. That's why I said the correction. Watch yourself. Control yourself. When you see yourself slipping away, what is that song that we sing that, Lord, help me because we are a people that are prone to wander. We get out of sorts with God at times. Well, they weren't guilty of going astray, but if they found themselves beginning to wander away from the Lord, they needed to correct themselves. He says, else if you do in any wise go back and cleave unto the remnant of these nations, even these that remain among you and shall make marriages with them and go in unto them and they unto you, Know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you, but they shall be, oh, look at this, snares and traps unto you and scourges in your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given you. They will become snares and straps, as traps and scourges and thorns. That'd be enough for a sermon right there. Well, we won't deal with it. But Christian, you are called upon to correct yourself that God will not have to bring scourging into your life. God is going to correct us if we begin to wander off. Remember what Hebrews 12 and 5 says, Have you forgotten the exhortation that speaketh unto you as unto children? My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. I'm going to tell you what, it's a lot better to listen to that rebuke than to have to endure the chastening that follows if you don't listen to the rebuke, or if you don't listen to the chastening, the scourging that follows. The next thing that Joshua does is he enters into a discussion lightly about the inner witness of the experience of Israel in their heart and in their soul. They know. Look at what he says. And behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth. And ye know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing hath failed of you All the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you, all are come to pass unto you, and not one thing failed thereof. For us today, Christian, you know that God's promises are true, and they have come to pass. God has quickened you. God has given you life. God has granted to you faith and repentance. God has given you the energy and the power and the protection. Don't let anything change your thinking. Don't let your fear and your reverence of God ever diminish. God hasn't failed in one of his promises. Since not one word of God has failed in the good things, Joshua reminds them the same thing is true of the bad things that can happen if you trespass God's covenant. Look at verse 15. Therefore, it shall come to pass that as all good things are come to pass, hmm, or come upon you, which the Lord your God hath promised you or promised you, so shall the Lord bring upon you evil things until he hath destroyed you from off this good, good land, which the Lord your God hath given you. When? You have transgressed the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and have gone and served other gods and bowed yourself to them. Then shall the anger of the Lord be kindled against you, and ye shall perish quickly from off the good land which he hath given you. Now, Christian, you can't lose your inheritance, but you can certainly lose the joy of your inheritance. 
the faithfulness of God upon which you can look back upon should also be the reason that you need to correct yourself, to control yourself, and to have the conviction to follow God. You see, it is the love of God which brings chastening into the Christian's life. Brendan, this is our message to you of the whole message that we've learned. There was the call to congregate. If you've gotten comfortable staying home and listening to these messages when you can be here and assemble, here's the call. Congregate. Come assemble. That's what a church is. You're supposed to assemble. But when you do, remember, what are we supposed to do? We are gathered together so that we might be reminded. In fact, I'm going to tell you one of the reasons why we have kind of changed our Wednesday night services long ago was that we would have an opportunity to give praise and thanksgiving unto the Lord. But you know how few now come out? Maybe you've gotten used to staying home, but I'm going to tell you, it ought to be a well-attended service to remind ourselves, especially, oh, I can't go because I'm just so down and out. That's when you need to go. That's when you need to sing praise unto the Lord and let that praise change your heart. In these gatherings, we've been called together to consider all that God has done for us to have courage. When we go back out the door, you need that courage to face the world we live in. This is an antagonistic world like it's never been before. And we re, but we need to be reminded of God's faithfulness because he will tend to us even when we are not faithful. You know that God has promised that even when you're not faithful, he'll remain faithful. Unbelief in men will not change God's faithfulness to them. Joshua called for correction, for control, and for consistency. Don't turn. Cleave unto the Lord. Adhere unto him. Stay separated from the world to God. Christ has done everything for us. The blessings are there for you. Endure the chastening. Give reverence unto the Lord and submit yourselves to him. And remember this, if you are enduring some chastening, remember that no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. But it also serves a profitable purpose. He tells us in Hebrews 12, lift up those hands that hang down. I don't think he just means to put them up but means to put them up in praise and admiration and prayer. Lift up your hands in praise and thanksgiving and change your direction. This charge of Joshua's has now been given to you. Come and assemble with us. Learn how to consider all that God has blessed you with. Have the courage to face out this world with all the tribulation and the turmoil that's going on and be prepared for the correction if we begin to wander. May the Lord bless you and keep you.